Happy Palm Sunday! I'm so glad you joined us here this morning, uh, worshiping on Palm Sunday. And I wish that we were able to be together and that I could give you a palm branch in person. Uh, because, well, to be honest, I have more palm branches than I know what to do with. We ordered these before the lockdown started. And, uh, well, they still got delivered. So, anyways, uh, thank you for being here online and worshiping online. I will uh, hold these palm branches up high for you today and just have to hold, hold one for everyone. Today, of course, we look at the story of the triumphal entry when Jesus rode into Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week and uh, he, he rides in the, the cries of adulation, cries of Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, literally the people crying out for him to save them. And then we're gonna take a look at what happens, what changed over the next few days, and how do we come from, from this joyous day of Palm Sunday to the somber day of Good Friday? So blessings on your service today, wherever you are, whenever it is that you're watching this. Um, if, you're, if you're a member, a visitor, somebody who randomly came across our, our page on YouTube or Facebook, read about us in the paper, however it is that you're joining us here this morning, uh, we are so happy to be celebrating Palm Sunday with you in whatever way we possibly can. Uh, and we look forward to the day that we're able to gather here together, together again and uh, that day, uh, you know, people are, are worried about what it's going to be like when we come back, we finally get back together and, and be able to be here in the church and start worshiping again. And, you know, we missed all of Holy Week. We, we missed Easter. Uh, who knows how long this is going to last and, and what we're going to miss. But let me tell you one thing. When we get together again, that first Sunday when we're able to, to gather uh, as a congregation, it is going to be so joyous. It, it will be the most joyous service uh, I think we've probably ever had. It'll be Palm Sunday, Easter, all the holidays wrapped up into one, and I personally cannot wait. Uh, and maybe when you come, I will hand you one very dried out palm <laughs> and, and we can catch up, because uh, otherwise I don't know what to do with these. But blessings on your worship service today. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you join us uh, this coming week for our Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday services as well. Let us begin our service with our opening hymn. Let us sing together hymn number 442, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. The scripture focus for this Palm Sunday comes from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, beginning with the 12th verse. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. You may be seated as we sing together hymn number 441, Right On, Right On in Majesty.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, happy Palm Sunday. We're finally here, right? We've made it through this Lenten journey, and we come to Holy Week. I don't know about you, but it, it feels odd to me a, a little bit, right? I mean, we've, we've been in this uh, stay-at-home lockdown for a little while now, and uh, it, it just feels like we're a little bit disjointed from the Lenten process, and it's surprising to me that we're already here at Holy Week. But I think maybe that surprise fits in with our story today. Because this triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, it's a surprise to a lot of people, I think. Right? Very quickly, it seems that Jesus has won the people over. And, you know, if you ever want to know how to, how to get somebody to throw a parade in your honor... All you got to do, it seems, is raise a dead guy back to life, right? Somebody who's been dead for four days, like Lazarus was, raise him back to life. And people start to crowd around and gather. They're interested to see what happened, right? In our text, uh, or right before our text, it says that all these people, they, they go out to Bethany to see what had happened. Because news of Lazarus coming back to life, it spreads very quickly, like wildfire. And people come out to see Jesus, to see Lazarus, right? And, and they're there, and they're, they're listening to Jesus. They're, they're hearing him preach and teach, and they're learning from him. And then he, he, he journeys to Jerusalem for the Passover. So when this happens, you know, they all go with him, naturally. They're all going to, to Jerusalem for the Passover. So there's this big crowd that follows Jesus, that are singing his praises, right? That, are, are, that want to follow him to see what he's going to do next. So you got this crowd that's behind him. And then there's all those people who are already in Jerusalem for the Passover. When they hear that Jesus is coming, they go out to see him. So Jesus, as he's, as he's moving from Bethany to Jerusalem, he has people behind him, he's got people in front of him, he's got people just all around him who are there to learn from Jesus and who are there probably to see what he's going to do, to, to be in on the next miracle. So it's a very exciting kind of electric time. And I think this comes as a surprise to a lot of people there. Maybe it even comes as a surprise to the Pharisees who, who can't seem to believe Jesus' uh, fame, his popularity. They don't seem to get it. They don't really understand why. And that's sort of at the heart of the problem for them, right? They, they just don't get who Jesus is and they don't understand why all these people are drawn to him. But in our text today, we get to see Jesus acting in a very messianic way, right? He's there fulfilling that role of Messiah, that long-promised Messiah who the Jewish people were waiting for to come and save them. But let me read to you a little bit uh, from our text today. This is from John chapter 12, starting with verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So we have Jesus here riding into Jerusalem uh, on a donkey, right? And the people are waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna. It, it's got to be... It's got to be just an amazing sight. Let's talk about what the people are shouting out to Jesus. Right? They're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And that word Hosanna, it means save us now, basically. Uh, it's a request for Jesus to save them. And you know, we can argue a lot about what exactly they meant by that. Uh, and probably different people meant different things. But this idea of saving the people of Israel, 
uh, what they're talking about is, you know, they are under the rule of the Romans right now. Uh, they've had a hard time of it over the years, for sure, being uh, sent off into slavery, and, and they want someone to restore them to that uh, position of power that they used to enjoy. Right? They want to be restored back to the time of King David, uh, when, when the, the children of Israel were, were a, a strong nation kind of on top. And they want this person, this uh, leader that God is going to send, to restore them to that rightful place. So a lot of them, I think, when they, they cry out, save us now, what they're talking about is, is from the temporal things that are going on right then. Uh, the, the, the Roman rule and oppression. But, you know, we know that that's not really why Jesus came. We have the, the benefit of, you know, 2020 hindsight to, to look back and, and see that Jesus, he's going towards something far greater, right? This is just the beginning of Holy Week. And by the time we're, we're done with Holy Week, we're, we're going to see Good Friday, we're going to see Christ's crucifixion, and then we're going to see Christ's resurrection. And that's not what the people were expecting. When they asked for a Savior, when they wanted Jesus to be their Savior, they wanted something political, something there and then out of him. They weren't thinking eternal salvation by any means. Right, we, we see this, if we continue on and even just look at more of what they, they say, they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, they're not talking about Herod, right? That's, that's for sure. Uh, they're talking about Jesus, which, you know, I said it before, this is a dangerous thing for them to be saying, you know, to, to be there at Jerusalem at the Passover time, uh, with all these people around, with the, the Pharisees around, with people overhearing them, to be claiming Jesus as king? Well, that can get you in a lot of trouble. Right? I mean, you know, just think of what uh, Herod's, the, the current Herod's father, uh, the other Herod, did when, when he heard that a baby king was born. Right? He, he murdered all of those little babies. And you know, the Herod we have now, he's not much better, right? His son isn't any better. Uh, he, is, he is a man who does not want a challenge to his authority. He likes to think that he's king, and he wouldn't put up with anyone else claiming to be king or, or claiming that somebody else is king even. And that's to say nothing of the Roman authority. Right? I mean, Herod, he likes to think of himself as, as king of the Jewish people, but he's really not. Right? He is, he is a, a, an under ruler of the Romans. You know, the Romans put him in charge. They said, okay, you get to rule, uh, but you answer to us, which is not exactly being king. Right? Uh, so so to, to challenge the person that the Romans put in authority is to challenge the authority of the Romans themselves. Uh, and they didn't tolerate that at all. So, so for the, the people there at the, the triumphal entry, as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, for them to be shouting anything about the king of Israel, that's dangerous. Right? It, it's, it's the kind of thing that could get somebody put to death. Which... You know, that's, that's where we're going, right? And it's too bad in many ways because just looking at the scene there, you'd think that people would be able to tell that Jesus isn't coming in as a, a conquering hero. Not by any means. Um, you know, sure, he, he's getting the, the adulation of all the people. He, he's very popular. But... He's not a gladiator or something like that, right? He, he's not some big Roman general riding in on a chariot. Jesus, he very intentionally finds a donkey to ride in. And not, not just a, a donkey, but a, a donkey's colt, 
right? A, a little donkey, a baby donkey. So this is not a big, strong animal. It's not, it's not a general on a war horse sort of thing. This is Jesus riding in on this little baby donkey. Not exactly threatening. Not an imposing image. And this is, this is all, all done to fulfill prophecy, right? Because there are some connections to a king riding on a donkey that are Old Testament connections that, that uh, do sort of cast Jesus in the light of the king. But even in the Old Testament, uh, as, a, as a king rides a donkey, it is a symbol of peace, right? Because, you know, you ride a chariot to war or a horse, at least, something like that. You don't ride a baby donkey. So this image that Jesus is, is fulfilling, the prophecy that he's fulfilling, it is clearly a message of peace, That seems to be ignored by the, the officials, uh, by the, the Pharisees. They just don't seem to pick up on this, or they refuse to see it. Now, one of the things that has spoken to me this week uh, concerning this text, uh, with our current situation in particular, is just how quickly things seem to be changing. How quickly Jesus gathers this crowd after bringing Lazarus back to life. How quickly they, they are, are there and uh, excited to shout hosannas and to give him praise. To lay down their very cloaks on the path so that he can have this, this paved, carpeted, red carpet path to come into to Jerusalem on. But then how quickly we see things turn. Right? I mean, this is Sunday of Palm Sunday, right? the beginning of Holy Week. And by the time we get to Good Friday, we have so many people there shouting for Christ's death. How did it change so much in one week? I mean, it's a question that I've kind of been asking myself at times. Uh, you know, as we go from normal life where we get to go around and go to the library and the movies to, to a, a stay-at-home, shelter-at-home society uh, where you know, we're afraid to leave our houses. Didn't it kind of feel like all that happened overnight? I mean, I know it wasn't quite overnight, but in the span of a week, it seemed like things got very real very quickly. And we all had to adjust to this new normal. And I think Jesus goes through the same thing here in Holy Week. The people, they go through the same thing. They go one day from Hosanna, Hosanna. And then they wake up a couple days later and it's crucify him, crucify what happened in between? And there's really nothing that we can point to that we look at it and say, oh, well, well, that's where Jesus lost the people. You know, it made sense that he was popular here on Sunday, but by the time we get to Friday, uh, well, of course he's lost all his followers. No, I mean, he challenges the authority. That's for sure. Uh, and, and he offends some people as he preaches the truth. But throughout Jesus' ministry, he's, he's kind of been doing that anyway. And he hasn't lost all the people yet. It just seems to be increasing his popularity. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on? What's happening here during this Holy Week? Why is this Holy Week different? There's nothing that happens from Sunday to Thursday that we could point to and say, that's why everybody hates Jesus now. That's why they all wanted him dead. I think perhaps you know, that should tell us something. Maybe we should see that as a sign. I think we need to see this as evidence of God's hand. God's hand is so clearly visible 
here on the path of Holy Week. And that's a comfort to us. Because what happens throughout Holy Week as Christ is arrested, whipped, ridiculed, crucified, put in the grave, if we didn't know that God was in charge throughout all this, that could be very scary stuff. This, this week that is coming, it, it's, it's a rough week. If you really dive into the text, if you really follow along with the devotions, if you really listen to the sermons and the readings of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we see a somber story. But behind that narrative of death, there is a subtext of life. Behind each dark word glows the outline of promise. And sometimes the hardest part is learning to look for that promise and that life. Right? It's seeing the, the silver lining on the clouds. That's not easy for us. And I'm sure you're dealing with that now. Is your home isolated? It's hard to see the good things that happen when we're surrounded by so much bad. You turn on the news, you hear the, the mortality rates, the, the death counts, state by state, country by country. And it is so easy for that to overwhelm every other aspect of our lives. But we can't let that happen. Look for the silver linings. Look for that, that bright truth behind the words. Take the time to, to, to spend during this isolation, during this shelter at home, where you dive into Scripture, where you connect with your family, where, you know, maybe, maybe you're not going over and having tea with your neighbors, but maybe you're talking to your neighbors from their porch to the street as you, as you take advantage of these nice days and you're out walking. Maybe find a way to take this situation and turn it for good. Find the beauty here, even among the, the ugliness of, of what ended up being this year's Lenten season. Because that's what God wants from us. He wants us to see the good even among the bad. We can't get focused on just the bad. If we were to focus on just the bad, we would be focusing on Good Friday alone. We'd be focusing on the nails, the blood, death. But that's not what Holy Week's about. It's a part of it. Of course it is. But that's not what it's about. The crucifixion, that is, it's, it's a road that gets us where we need to go. And that, that ultimate destination that we're journeying towards, that's Easter. Easter. Oh, forget Monday, Thursday. Forget Good Friday. Remember Easter. Easter is the day where we get to stop and say, look at everything bad that's happened. None of it matters. Because our Lord has risen. So I hope you'll join me in celebrating this Palm Sunday. And, and taking up that same cry of the Jewish people as Jesus uh, came into Jerusalem. But let's mean it in a slightly different way. Let's take on the fullness of that message. Hosanna! Save us now, not just as our King, as our Lord, as our spiritual Savior. And that is a cry that you can continue to shout throughout all of Holy Week. You have my permission. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna from Palm Sunday to Easter morning.
because this is what Holy Week is about. Jesus saves. Listen, promise me something. Can, can you do that? Can you do me a do me a favor? And I mean this. Do me a favor. Don't lose hope. Ever. No matter what happens. Right? You have a Savior who loves you so much that he, he died on the cross, suffered death, and rose just for you. Don't lose hope. This is, this is what Palm Sunday is about. It's about hope. We have hope on this day. If you ever worry that you're running out of faith, running out of hope, running out of love. Just remember Easter's coming. The end of quarantine is coming. Things will get better. I know that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray for the church, that the Lord would defend her against all enemies, and keep her true to Jesus Christ by the power of your word and spirit. Gracious Lord, keep your scattered church in your mercy, that she may endure the assaults of the evil one and remain faithful for the sake of those numbered within your kingdom and those who have not yet heard the gospel and been brought to faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, by your Spirit, you have gathered us as your church and promised that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in our midst. And we pray you to be with us even when those gatherings be online rather than face to face. Do not allow stress or disaster to distract us from the particular vocations into which you have called us to serve in the church, home, and community. Grant to us every gift and blessing needful that we may honor our calling and serve you to the best of our ability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Lord, you have established the kingdom of the left and hold accountable all those who govern in this and every place. Guide our president, the members of Congress, our governor, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws, that they would serve nobly and wisely, pursuing the path of justice and protecting the citizens entrusted to them. Give them the wisdom and strength needed to bring our world out of crisis and back to stability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, your grace is sufficient for all our needs, and you have promised to be the strength of the weary, the hope of those who fear, the healing of the ill, the fullness of those disabled, and the peace of all who are distressed. Hear us on behalf of our nation and the world suffering pandemic and isolation. We pray especially today for Kristen, Christina, Eleanor, Jan, Dick, Jane, Doug, Rose, Bill, Kenneth, Kylie, Anita, Elsa, Ken, Edith, Joan, Bud, Ed, Nicole, Randy, Nancy, Jim, Gary, and Craig, and all whom we name in our hearts, that they may be well supplied by your grace in every time of trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, you give food to the hungry and provide for all our needs in this mortal life. Grant to us a grateful heart and acknowledge to use wisely and well all that you have entrusted to our care. Bless those who work to make, prepare, deliver, or serve our daily bread, and give relief to those whose work has been halted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we cry out to you, Hosanna, Hosanna, and we place ourselves and everyone for whom we pray into the care of your loving arms. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you in favor and give you his peace. Amen. Have a blessed Palm Sunday, and until we see each other again, stay safe and keep the faith. We sing together hymn number 743, Jesus, Priceless Treasure.
So the money changers, they made sure that you had valid money to use at the temple. Which reminds me, did you hear about the, the guy who was arrested for paying for his coffee with a counterfeit $10 bill? Yeah, apparently yeah, he ordered a decaf coffee with non-dairy creamer and extra artificial sweetener and figured that since everything else in the cup was fake, why not pay with fake money too? I know that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So there's a guy who goes to the doctor for his annual checkup. And the doctor gives him the physical and then comes back in and he sits him down. He says, he says I'm sorry, I got some very bad news for you. Uh, you only have three minutes to live. And the guy, he, he, he gets real nervous, uh, upset. He says, what, what, do you, what do you mean? Isn't there anything, is there anything you could do for me? And the doctor, he thinks about it. He says, well, I guess I could boil you an egg. Yeah, I know, that's a, that's a terrible joke. Horrible, horrible. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> that's such a terrible joke. I'm sorry, that joke is horrible. Uh, bad pastor. 